And there we go. So we are recording. Ladies, thank you so much. So this evening we are here to learn about how to start your own business, um, which is a brilliant topic. And lots of people asked for a session on this. And we are being supported fabulously by Julie, who will introduce herself shortly. And she's going to talk about her own business and some of her story. And then the wonderful team at Aldermore who have supported us in the creation of everything about this workshop. So we're very, very grateful to them. And Gail's going to be talking to us about marketing. I might persuade Joshua and Katie to say hello as well, but we shall see. So. First things first then, we are going to think about Julie's story and Julie is going to share that with us now. So Julie, thank you so much. And I will ask you some questions as, as we go through. So let's go to the first question, which is, Julie, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Okay, I'm a mother of five children, have a business and uh, I had three children at the age of 21. So I was living in a council estate in Wales at that point. And I had no idea how I was gonna get myself out there. I just knew I had to. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so Julie, um, who was your role model growing up? Well, that was my grandmother. Um, I used to go and stay with her. When, once I got to about the age of 12, I used to get the bus down to Crawley and I used to go and stay with her. Um, I lived in, on, in the Merseyside then on a council estate with no vision of the future of, of possibly having a business or, um, you know, definitely not having my own. The, the, the most I could hope for was an office job, but even that was unlikely. It was most likely that I was going to get married and have children. Um, so going down to visit my grandmother was quite a shock because she lived in Crawley and she worked in a company called Bothorps. And she said to me, right, you can come to work with me. She bought me a new outfit, took me to work. And I was astounded. I got there. She dressed absolutely beautiful. She had a suit on and a pearls. And I get down there and um, she's, she's in charge. She's, she's running the place. And I was like, wow, I've just never seen anything like that before. I was really shocked and impressed. And yes, yeah, she was my role model. I, I did think you had to move down south to be able to do that, but apparently not. Um, you can do it up north. I have friends who are doing it up north, but I did end up moving down south. Amazing. Your grandmother sounds incredible. And I know from yeah. talking to lots and lots of the girls that we work with that when you ask them who their, their role model in life is, very often they will say it's grand, nan, whatever name uh, is being used. As a grandmother now, that feels like quite a responsibility for um, children to fill my grandmother's shoes and to be able to inspire them like she inspired me, you know. It's uh, important. I'm thinking about it all the time. <laughs> Sounds like an incredible lady. So Julie, would you mind telling us a little bit more about um, your business and what inspired you? So what inspired you to start your own business? <clears throat> well, my husband worked for another firm and he's really good at what he did. He's an electrician and, um, you know, the, the company just wasn't a nice company to work for. And we, we talked about him going on his own. So we just got to the stage where we just started advertising for work. I, I sat, you know, at the computer and I was uh, sending out emails, which um, used to get a buzzing sound then when you used to log on to do emails. It wasn't just uh, as it is now. It was, um, yeah, very early days in the internet world. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, we just put newspaper adverts out for work and we started getting him work. Um, we also joined a, a little firm called React Fast. And so we did, you know, out of hours work for them. And then we started getting a little bit busier. So we took on somebody else and then we took on somebody else and then we took on somebody else. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that was about it. Before that, I mean, to, to fund the business, I was making sandwiches in the shed and pushing them round in, in the baby's buggy in the basket on the bottom to the different garages and they were buying them off me and that, and that was getting us in a few quid um, to, to help support us. Um, yeah, we just did whatever whatever we did um, to start the business. We were just desperate to get it going. Amazing, thank you. And you've kind of touched on it a bit already, but what would you say have been some of your challenges? Money, definitely money. I mean, um, we bought a house that we loved very, very much. 
and um, if we wanted to grow we have to sell the house and go into rented so we could use the equity to grow the business so um, but the, I mean there was a stage before because uh, I don't know if you know but that we are factored by Oldsmore and there was a stage before that where you know you were literally praying for checks to come through the door so you could pay the wages you were, you know it was scary it was really scary and then um we joined Oldmore and uh never again worried about money we just we were just able to grow if somebody said oh you know i've got another 150 pubs here do you want them it's like yeah yeah i can take them because we were getting funding so once the funding was in place it was easy it was good we were good to go but it was um the money getting the money to pay the wages was the biggest challenge in the first place for sure I think there's a really interesting lesson in there about, you know, working with an organisation like Aldermore who support you as a business in, in the right way. Yeah. Maybe we can have some space to talk about that a bit later on. Um, so what would you say have been some of your greatest achievements? OK, so we were small and uh, this is this is kind of one of my most proudest moments was um, we were small. We were just my husband, and two other engineers. I was doing the phone, sending out the invoices and um, I, I just thought one day I just put on a suit and I went to Green King. That they're, they're a local company, you know, big local company, and uh, they had a lot of pubs. And I just went and basically knocked the door and I said, "I'd like to see somebody um, in your property department." And believe it or not, they 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 let me go and see somebody. So I, and this guy said, well, "How can I help you?" And I said, "Well, we're we're a local plumbing and heating business, and." Um, we need some work, you know, we, we're growing and, and you know, we, we're good, we're really good, but uh, we need some work and, you know, it'd be nice if you supported a local firm, you know, a new local firm. So um, he gave me 50 pubs just like that. So I was like, yes, I came out there, I was so pleased, I was so pleased. So um, yeah, it was just knocking on the door and getting the opportunity. It was like, if I hadn't have done that, it wouldn't have happened, you know, but you know, I had tried lots of other things as well. So it wasn't the only thing I did. So you just got to keep going out there and you've got to keep trying. And eventually you'll knock on the right door if you knock on enough doors, I think. Brilliant. And a really important story there about you know, bravery and just sticking in a gun line sometimes and going for it. Fantastic. So thinking about the pros and cons of becoming a business owner, there's a bit of a list here, um, which I know you've kind of put together for us and thank you for that. So would you mind kind of talking through some of that? So starting with the pros, please. OK, well, the flexibility is really important because all this time that I'm telling you about, I had five children and two very young ones. So, so the older ones were like, I don't know, 11, 12, 13. So they helped with the babies, which was great. Um, but I needed to take them to work sometimes. You know, maybe Charlie would go to nursery, but Harry didn't have anywhere to go. So he'd be under the desk in one of those little rocking chairs. And, and I could do that if I was working for somebody else, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, if one of them was sick, I'd just take everything home, stay at home and, you know, have Thomas the Tank on low and just work. Um, and look after them at the same time and uh, yeah so you know could take the dog in if I wanted you, do, you can do what you like if you're your own boss and you know works with the other staff um, in fact we still do that they, everybody brings their dogs into work if they want to all their children we've got a big meeting room so if anybody's child has got half day or something they can bring them in they've got iPads in there that they play with um, yeah they're fine they all know it's not an issue at all then obviously the financial rewards is great um and now after living in the council house in my younger age we now have um, a portfolio of properties um which we've renovated as we've gone on and it won't be many years before i retire and we'll sell all them and just go on a world cruise and just have fun you know and just go right that's why we did it we had a great time so um the cons are obviously the longer working hours, but you know, there's also kind of some things with that. Obviously you're getting rewarded for that. And I would be sat in my pajamas at five o'clock in the morning doing the invoicing before the kids got up. So, you know, I do all of that at home. Um, lots of responsibility, you know, sometimes you, you employ 50 gas engineers and, you know, the weight of that sometimes like, you know, one of their wives will phone you and go, oh, it's Sylvie's birthday next week can can i is, 
that he'd be somewhere where I could arrange to get a cake sent for him or something. And you, and, and you just think of how many families and their children are depending on you. And then sometimes that feels huge, you know. And then, you know, the, having your own business, no guarantee of success. There's been plenty of times where we, we've just, like, even, say, um, last March when we locked down, I mean, our insurance is £90,000 a year. The money stops coming in. You know, it's so scary. And you just think, you know, you've got to pay all that and you've got 50 engineers, so you've got to pay 50 vans. You've got no money coming in. So, but we did it. I did a plan of how long we could last for and, uh, you know, what we'd have to sell if we needed. And yeah, we did it, but it was scary, really scary. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. Absolutely. And I think it's really important to reflect on the last year in particular, because that has been yeah. so differently challenging for different businesses. So thinking about then turning a passion into so a passion or a hobby into a business. So you've got some points to talk through there. So take it away. Okay, so I, I, if it's okay, I'd like to give you an example of my daughter who turned her passion into a hobby. Obviously, plumbing and heating wasn't my passion. Um, it was just working for myself and you know building a business. That was my passion. Um, but my daughter had twins and they had um, eating problems, you know, allergies and all kinds of stuff. And so all their baby years, she was con constantly researching, um, you know, what foods to, to take out of their diet, what foods to put in, what foods are safe. And then she started studying online. She um, earned some um, certificate certification to allow her to work in the business. And now she's opened her own little shop in Cambridge where... Um, she um, advises people on nutrition. She'll go into their houses and say, no, 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 you can't have that in your cupboard. You know, they'll invite her in. And obviously it's been a little bit difficult the last 12 months for her, but she's picking up again. And uh, yeah, so obviously I've helped her to do that um, in lots of different ways from painting the walls in her new shop to um, advising her what uh, accounts package to use and, yeah, so that, that's been lots of fun and uh, she, she's, do, she's doing well. So if you've got a passion, you know, that like she had, then, you know, it's great to follow it and build on it. And if you if you can work in, in something that you love, it makes it so much easier. You know, it's really hard to love sparge pipe work that's coming from urinals or gas boiler pipe work. But I love being in the business, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So um, speak to other businesses, so um, which is what we actually did when we started. We spoke and um, we made friends with other plumbing and heating companies in different areas and uh, they gave us advice and um, we still talk to them now and we still all advise each other. It's great. It's, it's like a nice network of plumbing and heating companies. Um, yeah. So that was it. You need to create a business plan. There's lots of templates online, as it says. And then health and safety is really big now, massive. So whatever you do, you do need your risk assessments and you do need all, all that information in, in place. And most importantly, be prepared to work hard. I mean, one of the best rewards I ever got was um, when I went to Green King, I was called back a second time. And they said, look, there's another, we've just bought, they bought another pub company out in London. And they said, we've got no idea what's going on there, but there's another 50 sites you can have to look after there, but no idea what condition they're in. We just bought them, we didn't inspect them. So, um, but they're yours to look after. So what we did without them asking was we went to every single pub and we took photographs and we found out the age of the boy, the rough age, the life expectancy. And I spent hours and hours typing this all into little booklets and then making front covers with a photo of the pub. And then I took the 50 booklets into Green King and they were just blown away. And they just said, do you know what? I mean, this is above and beyond. Take the Southeast, just have it. And so, so there, we are, there we are. We suddenly then increased to 500 pubs. So yeah, so going above and beyond just you know gave us that boost. They didn't ask us to do it. We just did it off our own back. And, they were just blown away. Yeah. 
Amazing. Sorry, I was just having trouble unmuting myself there for some reason. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, obviously, ladies, you'll be able to see we've got some pictures here of some different books about being an entrepreneur, being a teen entrepreneur, and uh, the Girl's Guide to Starting Your Own Business. In the takeaways that you all get sent at the end of um, calls like this, um, there are links to all of those books. So you can have an explore and maybe look at some other options for books that might help you in understanding how to do this yourself. Fabulous. So, Julie, your top tips, if you don't mind. Okay, well, you know, um, I, I put on there, believe in yourself and don't let self-doubt hold you back. You're as good as anyone else. And I really mean that. I mean, I was on my own with three children in Wales and I just, you know, I, I, I just, this is not acceptable. I, I will not live like this. This is not acceptable. Why can't I um, get out of this situation and, and have a business and um, look after my family properly, you know, and, and give my children what they deserved so you know I did I believed in myself and I pushed myself and I pushed myself and we got there it wasn't it wasn't a straight road it was quite zigzaggy but we we did get there don't stop trying we we learn from our failures that's absolutely true I mean when when Stevie and I first started we followed different roads before we got to the Green King and the Mitchell and Butler's routes and um yeah come back we we every, every year we talk about what we want to happen in the next 12 months and we talk about what went wrong and what went right and what we want to do this next year so that's we don't make new year's re resolutions on january 1st we sit down and we say okay what do we want to happen next year and uh, obviously last january's uh, in 2020 didn't quite work out but yeah we have a plan just to get back on our feet this year and Get, get everybody out back to work and off furlough yeah so surround yourself with inspirational people and we're doing this this is great you can meet people I mean honestly I wish I wish I had had something like this when I was a teenager somebody to encourage me somebody to to know that you know it's actually possible to do it um I would have loved that I would have really enjoyed it and you should make the most of it I think it's great and uh, do your research about your business that's important obviously you need to know everything and um yeah have fun follow your dreams definitely believe in yourself it's really important Julie, thank you so so much you're a hugely inspiring woman and we're extremely lucky to have you with us this evening so thank you so much for your time and um i agree you know the girls here and they come along to events like this entirely in their own free time and they are taking those opportunities um so fabulous and huge thanks to you so it says interval and get excited ladies we're just kind of breathing in and uh, moving on to the next thing um but now i'm going to introduce you to the wonderful gail um who's going to talk to you about marketing but i do wonder Katie and Josh, do you mind if I be a bit cheeky and ask you to unmute yourself and maybe just say who you are and just very briefly kind of who Aldermore are and what they do because you have fabulously supported us in this event and I think Julie was talking about the support you give and I think it would be important to just explain to the girls what you do, if that's okay. So I'm going to, Katie, I'm going to unmute you first if that's all right. Yeah, hi there, can you hear me okay? <laughs> Perfectly, thank you. Fab. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for having us along today. Um, myself and Josh uh, both work as, as part of the Aldermore group, uh, along with Gail, and uh, we've been, uh, we've, we had the privilege really of setting up a, a bit of a, a working group ourselves to, to look at how we can support young women, the next generation of, of women coming through to uh, business uh, and what we can do to support our local communities. And um, we, we've really enjoyed working with the Girls Network. Um, this is the first event that we've hosted ourselves. So I hope you're all enjoying it uh, and taking as much from it as, as, as I know we are. Um, but really our passion is about supporting uh, young girls, young women in our local communities. Um, we're hoping we can do more of these types of events moving forward. Um, but in terms of, of our business, um, 
we've got the the Aldermore uh, brand, which is which is based in England, and I'm sure Josh can tell you a little bit more about them. Um, I'm I'm part of another company called Motonovo Finance, uh, so we're part of the, of the overall uh, Aldermore group. Um, and what we do is specialise in um, finance products for vehicles. Uh, so we're based in Cardiff. Um, I have a 12 year old daughter myself. And so this is a huge, um, a huge sort of love for me in terms of supporting young women and being able to reach, reach young women and um, yeah, and, and get out and do these sorts of events. So hope that gives you a bit of an overview, uh, a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I'll hand over to Josh, who can tell you a bit more about the, the actual banking side, if that's okay. Brilliant, thank you, Katie. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm an audit uh, executive uh, for Aldermore in the, uh, the Manchester, but we're based in the Manchester office, but I've been uh, working from home for the past uh, 12 months. Um, so but what we do, um, Aldermore, see, I work in the invoice finance um, part of the business. And like you say, um, for instance, for example, uh, Julie, with their business, um, SLH, what we do is we fund the invoices. Um, so to, to summarise that, what we'll do is we'll purchase the invoices uh, from them and can fund them at a set rate uh, up front. And like you say, can pay wages, for instance, you know, and then we'll await the, uh, the collections to come through in whether it's 30 days, 60 days uh, in terms of the invoices. And yeah, that's just a, um, a brief summary of what we're doing. That's in the invoice finance um, part of the business there. And what I do, uh, you know, say on a day-to-day -day basis. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Josh. And I think it's really interesting to think about that purchasing of invoices. It's something I think I wasn't aware of um, before. I think for the girls to know that actually you can get that sort of bit, sort of support, financial support from an organisation. Yeah, like definitely. Baltimore is something really, really interesting yeah. and useful to know. So thank you for that. So. Gail, you are up. I'm unmuted. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just, um, you know, very, very inspiring story from Julie. Um, and um, just to echo what Josh is saying is that we do have different products at Aldermore and I work in a marketing team. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a minute. But um, there are loads of fundings available for businesses other than what people go normally for like credit cards they could go for a uh, personal loan etc but they are solutions that are bespoke for businesses and for your circumstances and that's what we pride ourselves in doing is listening to your specific needs and making a tailored solution to help you fund and grow a business so it might not be for tomorrow, but, you know, it's something that, you know, you, you can start thinking about. Anyway, I'll start my presentation. Um, so um, go back to the first one. Sorry. If we can go back to the first slide. Sorry. Um, I, so yeah, I, was, I was trying to be helpful and just. Oh, sorry, that's all right. <laughs> Uh, I added a little, uh, a little bit to my, uh, to my script. Um, so my name is Gail Wharton and I'm a marketing manager at Audemars Bank. Um, to give a little bit of background, I've studied marketing in France, where I'm from, uh, through a business school, and then I moved to the UK after the end of study, uh, an end of study placement, uh, which I did for a company called Victoria Wine. Um, I've been in marketing for over 15 years and I've worked in different marketing roles for various brands and product categories, including Samsung, HTC, Sky, Nokia, Amazon, and now Audemars. And I've worked with toys, TV network, mobile phones, and now finance. Um, what I love about marketing is that you're always learning, learning about new ways of doing things, new techs that improve the customer experience, new ways to engage with your audience. And trust me that the marketing that I learned about 20 years ago has really moved on uh, from what it was. So we didn't know what influencers were, uh, what digital, digital marketing didn't even exist at the time. However, over the years and across the different products, categories and services that I've worked with, they are some basic concepts that will never change. So for the next 20 minutes, I'll try and give you an overview of marketing and what marketing is and why it's important for a company that sells uh, a product or a service. Um, so yeah, if we start the next one. So I'm sure a lot of you have been uh, taking part in various quizzes during the lockdown uh, and have been playing this little game of guess the brand. Um, so 
you know, if we have a look at, at these and, and try and recognize the brand, um, so I'm, I'm pretty certain that, um, you know, you, you would have recognized most of these. Um, so we can have the next one, please. Um, yeah, and, and the reason is is because they are they are being uh, so representative of the way they they represent. So it, can you, um, yeah, can you just just shout at me? Yeah, just say, yeah, next slide, can, please. And I'll just yeah, I'll yeah, just yeah, keep, keep going. going. So um, <laughs> so the way they talk. So that's the way that's what we call tone of voice. So for example, in Austin, they have a very distinctive tongue in cheek, fun, and conversational way of um, of talking. Which you can find across their communications, like their website, their social media. Um, so whether it's a logo, so we know the the Pepsi logo there. So if you keep carry on, uh, me, sorry, yeah. Um, so or the packaging. So for example, the iconic tub of uh, of Pringles, or the way they look. So you will instantly recognize Apple images there because they have a certain look, a certain feel, uh, a treatment that you know um, you know it's them straight away. Uh, next one. So then uh, marketing is, is also how you communicate to your audience. So via advertising, uh, like here we've got websites, uh, we've got banners on the website or with uh, press or ads on social media. So, you know, when you talk to a friend about something and then all of a sudden you've got an ad on a topic that you've been um, you've been talking about that pops up on your feed. So if you look at this, uh, this was my feed. So it looks like, I've, you know, I've been talking about um, getting a better smile and now I'm getting an ad for, for braces. So it's very, uh, very uh, targeted. Um, so the next one is uh, also press or uh, what we call PR, press relations. So which is when a newspaper talk about your product or your company in an article uh, or emails as well, which is a way, um, you know, to, to keep talking to your customers once you've got, once they give you your their email, then obviously you, you can keep that engagement. So these are different ways that um, we can see brands communicating with us. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, next one, please. Yeah. Um, so what people see, your brand, your logo, your advertising, your social media, this is, and this is what um, the important word is here is see, because that's what people can see, like the, the brand, the logo, the tone of voice, the various form of communications are just the tip of this iceberg. Because below the C, and in this instance, before we get to the visible part of that iceberg, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done to determine what you see as a customer, when you see it, where you see it, and this is what marketing is: is all that all that um, work below below the level of the of the sea. Um, so let's play another game. Let's pretend that we're launching our own business, and we've got Chloe, Evie, Alexander. They already have great ideas about some businesses, and you know, although this is a specific product, it could be um, it could be working uh, for them as well. So. For example, um, in your spare time, you love making jewelry. So you've been making some for your friends' birthdays, your cousin's Christmas present, or you've even had your mum's friends asking you to make some pieces for their daughters. So that got us thinking a little bit that maybe we could turn this into a little business. And if so, what should we be doing to make this a little success story? So before you launch um, that new business, there, you need to do a little bit of, uh, of brand work. Let's see, change please. Um, so first, uh, it's always good to start with, uh, with some research. So research will help you build an image of what, uh, what the market, the audience and what people, other people are doing. So understanding the market will tell you a lot of things, uh, whether it's a new market, so for example, electric cars, or a more mature market, like a mobile phone, or a declining market, like CDs, for example. Uh, so this can help deciding whether people know about your product category, or there's an interest in the category. So for example, you wouldn't launch a product in a declining market. Then you need to understand about the customers in your market. What are they looking for? What is their need? So uh, are you looking at you know, the young girls who are looking for 
um, cheap and cheerful jewellery or are you looking for um, a, a grandmother that are looking for a special gift for, for, their, child, for their grandchildren? Um, and also you've got the competition to so understand who they are what they're doing, who they are targeting as well. So for example, Claire's accessories will be for a young audience, where like Tiffany's will probably be more, a more mature or, or rich, um, rich audience. Um, the next step uh, that you'd be working on uh, or the plan, um, I don't know if I get to the next one, is, is so that you'd be working on the, on, the, on the plan or what we call the strategy. So. Uh, for this, we use what we call the four P's. So if you Google marketing and, and marketing definitions, uh, this one is probably the most classic uh, concepts of marketing. Um, the terms might change slightly, but overall, it's a concept of around the four pillars that will help you build a solid proposition. It's around the product, the price, the position, and the promotion of your product. So if we look at the product, first, what is your product? What are the benefits of your product? Uh, what are your key messages? So for example, for your jewelry business, you might want to play on the handcrafted side, bespoke side of the product. You've made it yourself. It's for one person, it's the unique product that you've made, or is it made with recycled materials, for example? What sets you apart from the rest? Is your, your package, how will you present your, your product? Um, also, good to understand when to launch um, so, and, and work with seasonality, so Christmas, you know, Easter, Mother's Day, um, but also when you need to start evolving or even taking products from the market as well, so you don't drag products that don't work. Um, price, price is a, so the second, second pillar um, is Price is very important. You need to understand all the components that come into the design, the making, the packaging, uh, the distribution, which is where you sell your product, and the promotion of your of the products. And that this will help you build a, a, a pricing plan, which is when to have the pro when to have your product at full price, when you can start doing discounts or multi buys or sales. So you need to work out what we call a margin, which is the difference between the price you're selling at and the total cost of the products. And that gives you the, pro the profit, which is the, the money that you keep for yourself. Um, you also need to think about where you'll be selling your products. So this is called the position or placement. So look at all the channels that are available to you. So if you're selling direct, this could be a market store or a school fair. Um, obviously, a branded store might not be uh, on the cards yet for that, you know, little jewelry um, business. But obviously, uh, for example, Chloe, who wants her to have a hairstyling salon, that that would definitely be um, be a place. Although you could be doing uh, home calls as well. Uh, so most probably you'll you'll start with also creating a website. So you need to ensure that this is simple and clear for your customers. Um, you could also sell through a third party, which is called a distributor. So you could do that online. So if, if you think about Amazon or Etsy, um, they sell, you know, like one off products or also retail. So like supermarket department stores. Um, and in the example of our little business here, we could do, um, you know, we could sell through a local coffee shop or a little high street boutique or gift shop. Uh, that sells product, local products. So there's like, loads of ways of, of and, and yeah, ways of, of selling your, your product. And then finally, the promotion. This is how you, you will bring your, your product to life. Uh, and that is the top part of that iceberg. If you remember that, that's the part you will see. So this covers all the aspects of communication from PR to advertising and sales. So for example, I would think that uh, social media would be a great place to start in this instance, uh, create a Facebook or an Instagram page for your business. You can also use TikTok, of course. Um, have some, you know, you need to create a regular post that are a mix of content. Uh, it could be purely focusing on your product, but also maybe something about uh, where you source your material from, talk about the local area, where you get your inspiration from, create your story and, and showcase that story. Um, 
you can also create competition competition to get more likes um, and people to follow you a giveaway competition for people sharing your posts uh, you can also use quotes and testimonials from customers to show how satisfied they are and really talk you know it's a great way to talk about your your business is to show how people are happy with the service or, or the products that you're providing. Um, also encourage your friends and family to share. Uh, and you could also contact, contact the local newspaper to do an article on your business. Um, they're always looking for content. So, you know, it could be a great way to, to promote and, and expand your, what we call the reach. Um, sometimes a leaflet uh, through a door could also help boost your business. Uh, especially around festive times. So if you think about Christmas, uh, you could start doing leaflet mid-October, beginning of November. So if you get orders, then you have time to produce them, um, get in early. Um, and then also uh, an idea could be to approach a local figure uh, and ask them to talk about your business or send them a sample of your work, to explain your story and maybe they'll post on their own social net network. So. We see this with, um, with celebrating under endorsing brands, and I'm sure everybody would like Miley Cyrus to wear their own jewelry. But um, there's also, you know, think a bit more local, a bit more accessible. So, for example, where I live, there's one of um, one of our MPs um, talks about, you know, every week he's promoting uh, a small local business on on her um, on a Facebook feed, and I'm sure. That you know, I she's promoted that that young girl's um, cake business, and you know because I saw that on my Facebook, then I ordered a, a, a birthday cake for my own daughter. So you know, it's, it's the kind of like word of mouth recommendation, etc. That that works wonder for small businesses. Um, but there's one element that you always always have to have to remember about, and that is the customer. Uh, the customer is always at the center of your plans. So you need to understand who you talk to, and this is called segmentation. Uh, this is understanding who you want uh, to buy your product. So you need to understand this because that will influence all the aspects of the four P's that we've just gone through. So for example, the price, if you're targeting a young audience with limited budget, the price will be critical for them to access your product. Um, if you're selling, selling a, an electric um, stair lift, so targeting an older audience, if you spend advertising on TV, then your money will be much better spent on a, on a TV spot during an afternoon uh, murder mystery movie rather than um, the middle of the ads for the Endgame movie, for example. Uh, so really understanding um, your audience and what they like, um, you know, to make sure that you're, you're talking to them at the right moment. Uh, and then likewise, a brand targeting a youth audience will be more likely to advertise using influencers on social media. And then you'll see a, a buy uh, now option uh, within the social media. So, you know, you, you can buy straight away. So remember, it's all about your customer and how you offer an experience that will delight them. Um, and then once you're live, so that's my next slide, please. Uh, once you're, you're live, uh, you'll be getting a whole load of data and information. So you need to take the time to review and analyze. And this is on, on what is, is working and what is not. Um, so, for example, social media will give you loads of analysis on how your posts are doing. Uh, same with your website. There's a, call, uh, a tool called um, Google Analytics that can help you understand where your customers are coming from, which page they visit, what time they're coming, and then where they're going after that. So it's, it's very rich information. So make sure you use all of that. Um, sometimes it can be overwhelming because it gives you so much information, but uh, it, it's really good to help you direct um, your next steps, basically. And um, also customer feedback is, is very important. So. Good feedback is always great. It tells you about what you're doing well, what works, and also you can use it in your social posts to show other people. You know, sometimes you see quotes um, on, on social, people saying, you know, how much they, they like using a product or, you know, and they recommend it to their friends, etc. cetera. Uh, you can see those, you know, five-star um, ratings uh, popping up on websites. So this is very important, but also bad feedback is even more important because, it highlights areas where you can improve. So 
never ignore a customer complaint complaint or a back comment for example on your social media and resolving it will make your customer happy and then also will transform a bad experience into a good one but it will also um, help you learn why your business is not doing really well and improve um, as a result so all of these feeds back into uh, your research can i just have the next click please um, so all of this feeds back into your research and will help build new plans to adapt your, your communication. So, for example, you might notice that from your sales and your data that people only buy one item at a time on your website. So you might want to create a post or a, a little bit of advertising around bundles. So like, for example, like, you know, you do a package with a, a necklace and a pair of earrings uh, with a small discount. And then you send, you might see more um, an uplift on sales uh, and then an increase in your revenue. So keep updating your customers, your customer base as well, that like monthly or quarterly newsletters to, ex to existing customers that will showcase new ranges or products that might help with some of your sales. So there you have it, um, the full marketing iceberg. Um, so what you have to remember is what you see above that sea level is influenced by what happens underneath. And then what happens above that sea level will then influence what, what happens below. Um, so from, you know, go slow, it's always learning, marketing is always readjusting, uh, but as I said, make sure you always keep your, your customer as your number one priority, and I think with such a solid plan, um, Tiffany's will be starting to be worried about us, you know, and our little jewelry business. So that's, that's me, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, ladies, it's a really good opportunity now to actually ask questions of Gail or indeed Julie. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording and I'm going to open the chat up so you can chat so everyone can see it if you want to, or you can send me a private message as well. So just give me one moment and I will stop recording. <laughs>